This allows you to build amazing apps. It's trying to make my life as easy as possible. One of the most powerful features when it comes to are using one of Flutterflow's most powerful features. Now, let's say you're pressed for time and you want to learn no code fast. Are there particular concepts that you should be focusing the majority of your attention on? Are there certain things that when you learn them, everything else will make a lot more sense? Well, fortunately there are. And in today's video, I'm going to be telling you the most important no code concepts that give you most of the knowledge when it comes to building apps. These are the exact concepts that a lot of people have problems with that when they master them, everything else will fall into place. Now, before we get started, as always, all the apps and all the resources that I'm going to be showing you in today's video, you will be able to get access to on my Patreon page. And you can learn more about our amazing Patreon community via the link below the video. Now, the first important concept that you need to master and internalize is called reactive programming. And this is something that you're going to stumble all the time, regardless what kind of app that you're building and what kind of tool that you're using in order to build this app. And so if you master this concept, a lot of things when it comes to building apps, is going to make a lot more sense and everything else is just going to be a lot easier okay and so to quickly demonstrate to you exactly how this works i have here a quick diagram to show you the power of reactive app development okay so we have here a user and as always the user is interacting with the app via the app's ui so here we have the ui and this could be you know a bunch of text or maybe the user is looking at some images or entering some data it doesn't really matter but regardless what happens is the user is interacting with the ui and then the ui is talking to the back end so the user might enter some text press a button called submit and then it's going to save this data and the user is going to get back a response. This is called a synchronous flow because it's not reactive and the app is expecting it. Okay, so if the user enters something, the app knows that the backend needs to come back with this data and it needs to do something with this data. And so because the app is expecting this data, it's not reacting to something that it didn't expect. It's expecting it and everything is fine. In the following case, we have a slightly different situation. So the user might be interacting with the app. The app might do something, but the backend or something else might not respond right away. It might respond if something happens and that something can happen now it can happen three seconds from now or it can happen tomorrow it doesn't really matter but the fact of the matter is that the app needs to expect it and most importantly it needs to react to it and this is exactly what reactive app development is all about it's about reacting on events that you might not expect to happen synchronously and so when it comes to building apps you want your apps to be reactive you want your app to send some events somewhere but you want your app to expect a response from that event and most importantly you want your app to be able to react to that event to that response that you eventually get from somewhere and you want it to be happen quickly and seamlessly so there's as little user interruption as possible okay and so when it comes to building these reactive flows in flutterflow which is my favorite no code tool of choice you have various options in your disposal so here i have a screen that shows you how you can make your app reactive to various pieces of information coming through from the back end or elsewhere. So in this first row here, we have a piece of data that's going to be received from Firebase Firestore and it's going to be displayed here. In the second row, we have a piece of data that's stored locally as part of App State but we also have a way for the user to modify this piece of data now fortunately whether you're getting your data from firebase's firestore or app state you can react to that data's changes in a very very reactive way so let me show you what i mean so here's the app running and what's cool about storing your data in firebase's firestore is that anytime you modify the data 
it's going to automatically reflect here. This is a feature of Flutterflow because it's able to get data changes instantly. So if I go into my Cloud Firestore dashboard here and I find the record, this is the record right here and I'm displaying the display name field. If I modify this field right here, let's say I put James 2 and I click update, that field is going to be automatically reflected here and as an added bonus i can display a particular message so if i come back here and i change this field i can come back here it changed it here and i'm able to display a particular message and this is what reactive development is all about it's being able to react things that the app might not automatically anticipate now let's say you're storing some data in app state which we're going to be covering in detail a little bit later in the video and you want to change that piece of data so right now we are displaying this initial data but because we don't have any initial data we are displaying a blank cell but let's say i enter mike here and i press update and when i do that i have a field that's automatically set in a very very reactive way and this is really nice because the user does not need to reload the app they do not need to go to another page there is no navigation there is nothing like that all of that is possible because these fields are reactive aware okay so if i change this field to let's say mic 2 press update it's automatically updated to mic 2 and you don't even need to reload the whole app go to another page or do something crazy because all that happens is this field is automatically updated and this is very very powerful and creates a very very positive user experience now let me show you how exactly that is done so if i go back to my app I have this field here and on this field I'm doing a couple of things. The first thing that I'm doing is I'm loading the data. So if I come back here, I have a backend query where I'm querying users. I have a single document and here I'm grabbing a single record where email is set to james at james.com because I don't want to get just any record. And so once I find that record, what I'm doing here is I'm displaying the name and whenever you are displaying records that are in your firestore db they're automatically going to be reflecting the changes so this is one big benefit that's built in for you in other words you get this feature for free because you don't need to worry about automatically refreshing the app anytime you have changes that you need to display another benefit that we get when we use firestore db is that anytime there is a change in the data that we are specifically dealing with the system can notify us automatically so if we come in here we have these actions here and if i open my actions i have this on data change and on data change is a trigger that triggers my app anytime there is a change in the data that I'm dealing with. So it's not just any data, right? It's not any random field. It's not any random collection. It's just that specific collection that I'm dealing in that specific field. So in our case, is that specific document there. So if we change the document, we are going to be giving an event that we can act on. Okay, so this is the event and this is our action. In this case, I'm just showing a snag bar, but obviously you can do anything that you want. You can send an API request, you can do anything that you want. But the most important thing here is the fact that we are able to get this trigger, right? We have this callback, which is what it's called in programming. And so if we did not have this trigger, we would have no way of knowing that some data changed and some data remained the same. So this is very, very powerful. And so if you're using Firestore DB, you have a lot of benefits because you essentially get the triggers, you get automatic data updates, you get a lot of good things. Now, let's say that you're not using data that's stored in Firestore DB you're using data that's stored in app state and app state is very very powerful in flutterflow as you're going to see a little bit later in the video but right now i have this app state right here which is state that's accessible throughout the entire app and i have a couple of fields and we'll cover this field a little bit later in the video but right now i have this field called name which is just a basic string type okay so just name right here there's no default value or anything like that 
And here we are displaying the value. And so when we start the app, because there's no default value, nothing is showing here, right? It's an empty field. But here, you know, this is an input field. And when the user enters something, they click update and this update has an action. And so the action here is update app state with the input that we have here. So this is input name two. If you come here, you see it's input name two. And what happens here is that it updates the app state, but updating app store by itself does not give us the reactive behavior. What actually gives us this reactive behavior is this setting right here, rebuild current page. Because what essentially happens here is that we update app state, but because this field here is dependent on the value in our app state, and we set rebuild current page, it's going to seamlessly rebuild this widget here with the updated value. And this is very, very powerful. Now, you can obviously do no rebuild, but you don't want to do that if you're aiming for this reactive behavior. And you can also do rebuild all pages and you want to do rebuild all pages whenever you have some other variables that are visible or that are important and they're also dependent on this specific app state. Otherwise, there's really no reason to do it. You can just leave it to rebuild current page. And so regardless if you're using Firestore DB as the source for your data, or you are using app state or page state uh, as the source of your data, you have this beautiful reactive behavior automatically built in to Flutterflow. And so this allows you to build amazing apps that automatically update themselves and automatically even trigger some other actions based on the fact that certain data was changed without you needing to do the heavy lifting. And so this way you can build amazing apps that your users will love. Now, the next important concept that you need to master when it comes to no code is repeating events and or looping, which are very, very similar. Now, looping is something that you're going to see all the time when it comes to development. And looping is a way to get the computer to do something repeatedly until a certain condition is met or not met. So here I have a page with two separate loops that do essentially two different things. Now this first loop, if I press this button, you're gonna see a certain progress indicator, okay? So it's gonna go up to 100. This is the current value here. And this is the indicator that essentially repeats itself showing you the same character every now and then. And I'm going to show you exactly how that works. Now, in the second example, I have a very, very simple slideshow that consists of several images here of cars. So I press this button here. You're going to see a slideshow right here that shows you different cars here. All right. And that slideshow is over. Now, how exactly is this functionality built? Well, let me show you exactly what's happening. Now, for the first example here, we have here a button. And if you click this button, you're going to have some actions that are going to be triggered so if you open this action we have here a loop as you can see the background is a little bit gray and anything any action that's inside this grayish background is a loop and in a loop you're going to have a condition that needs to be met for the loop to continue so i'm saying that as long as current digit is less than 100 uh, I want the loop to continue, okay? This is the main condition. This is essentially asking, okay, should I keep going? Because if this is false, the loop is going to stop, okay? If this is true, the loop is going to continue. And then what I'm doing is I'm updating a value. So I have a digit, essentially an integer that starts at zero and goes all the way to 100. Now, when it goes to 100, this loop stops. And so that digit that number never reaches 100. Essentially, it goes from 0 to 99. And on each iteration of the loop, we are incrementing this value. So we have a value that starts at 0. We check if it's less than 100, which is true. We increment it so it becomes 1. And then we wait 100 milliseconds. Okay, And then we keep going until that value is no longer until that condition here is false and that's going to happen 
when it's greater than or equal to 100. So if it's going to be equal to 100, this is going to be false and the loop is going to break out of this whole flow here. It's going to essentially break out of the loop. And then when the loop is done, I am resetting the value back to zero. So that way I can run that loop multiple times without needing to restart the app in this specific case now the way that you're seeing this progress bar there is actually a very very interesting flow so here i'm displaying the digit and this is useful for debugging this is useful in order to see if the loop is actually working because the functionality depends on this digit uh, showing you the right value okay and so this is where we are seeing that progress bar and so if i click here we have here a code expression and if you open this code expression up into the code expression we are passing this integer and this integer is actually the this current digit which is a state variable so we have a very very simple state variable which is an integer a current digit and it's being passed into this uh, code expression as a digit okay and here we have a code expression and what we're doing here is we're taking this string okay this little string here or consisting of uh four characters this is the first second third and fourth and this is an escape character here okay because we need to escape this character otherwise it's not gonna work correctly okay so you see these two uh backslashes there there's really only one backslash okay and this part right here it takes that digit and it gets a remainder when you divide it by three okay so the reason we're dividing by three is because we're counting from zero so zero to three or one to four which is the same thing but we gotta start at zero and we are dividing that digit so regardless if that digit is you know two or if it's 200 anytime we divide it by three and get the remainder the remainder is guaranteed to be anywhere from zero to three and this is perfect because now we can use that as a way to get the current uh the current character and so as that integer is increasing in our loop right we're incrementing that character we are getting the value that's you know divided by three and just the remainder so that value is going to be any one of these digits but it's going to go in order so this is going to be the first this is the second third fourth and then fifth six seven eight and then nine ten eleven etc etc so it's going to keep going but it's going to be in order and that's how we are getting uh this kind of animation that's how we are creating this animation using a loop and of course we have this current digit which is if you go over here this current digit is a local page state variable and it's perfect in this case because this variable only applies here okay this is exactly what we want and so as a result when you press this button we are continuously incrementing that one variable and then this code expression is calculating the right character and as a result you're seeing that animation and this is just one example of creating various custom animations for your app okay because you're gonna have situations where you know a user presses a button and now there's some work that that's being done somewhere and we need to show them some sort of um you know progress bar some sort of animation to let them know that hey the app is still there you know it did not crash or anything but they need to wait a few moments or a few minutes until the app finishes uh doing its task and in the second example i want to show you another example of a loop that i use to create a slideshow okay so in this case i'm using an app state variable called images and i am initializing this list of image paths here uh to a list of urls that contain different images of cars so we have a bmw a ferrari a lamborghini and a mercedes-benz here and then what we're doing is something that's very very similar so if you press on the slideshow guess what we have a loop but we have a different counter variable okay so here we're checking if it's less than 20 and if it's less than 20 we're going to be incrementing it so we're incrementing it by one and we have a delay 100 milliseconds so that that slideshow is not like instant because if you don't have a delay you're gonna it's gonna be very very quick right it's not gonna be a realistic slideshow but if you have a delay of 100 milliseconds 
or 300 milliseconds, anything under a second, uh, you're going to have kind of this nice animation slideshow. And then what I'm doing here is I'm going to this image here. And this image here is using this path here, right? So we're getting these images uh, from the internet, you know, via URLs. And here I'm just saying list item at index. And what is this list? This is the app state images that I initialized. And I'm just specifying that I just want a specific image at a particular index. And this index is a code expression well you guessed it we are you passing this uh, index here as the current image index but very very important we're using this operator here this modulus to get to divide by four and get the remainder because we want the value to be within within a certain range we want it to be between zero and three because if it's going to be four or five uh, you're going to have an error because you won't be able to get the right image because we have only four images, which are index zero to three. And so this is exactly what this does, right? When we divide it by four and we get the remainder, the remainder is going to be anywhere from zero to three. So zero, there's no remainder, which means it divides evenly. Otherwise, there's going to be a remainder of some sort. And this is exactly what this does. And so as a result, when we press this button, we have a nice slideshow now these are just two examples where you can introduce a very very interesting behavior kind of a ui change a progress bar a slideshow you can do tons of things and you can only do them with loops a loop is something that you just need to master because there is no way to mimic anything without creating a loop there is no way to get the system to continuously do something until a condition is met without using this loop so this is a very very important concept that allows you to build some very very powerful and user-friendly functionality into your app now the next important concept that you need to master that you're gonna see over and over and over again regardless of what kind of app that you're gonna be building is a conditional or multiple conditions okay so what exactly is a conditional so here I have a page that when the user does something, something else is going to happen. So when you're thinking about conditionals, you want to be thinking about if this happens, then that happens. Or if this happens, then that happens. Or if this or this or that, then something else might happen, right? You can have simple conditionals or you can have more complex ones. So in this example, if I click on this uh, pull down menu here and I select a, uh, a car brand, so let's say I select a BMW, we have here this image, this image widget is regenerated, right? Remember, it was empty. There was nothing there before, but now we're showing you the appropriate, the corresponding image right so it's a bmw here if i click here select a mercedes we're gonna see a mercedes if i click here and I select the ferrari same thing click here and lamborghini same thing now this is obviously a very very simple example because i mean yes you might have situations in your app where you're gonna have a very very similar flow maybe it's going to be a pull down and in fact there's you know many situations where you're going to have exactly this flow but typically you're going to have situations where you're going to have more complex flows now let me show you how you can implement this in Flutterflow because when it comes to actually implementing it there are a couple of ways that you can do it depending on your exact use case so let's go back to our UI builder here and this is our initial flow here right this is where we're selecting we're displaying so how does this work well it all starts from this drop down menu right this drop down menu here and so what we're doing is we're defining values but we're also defining labels now if you want you can only define values and if you do that and then they're automatically are going to be labels so if i don't define these labels then the labels are going to be these urls but i want flexibility right i want to be able to display the right label meaning the actual you know brand of the car the the model of the car the make of the car etc but i want the value to be something else completely that's useful for my use case right so in my specific use case we're displaying an image and this image is being displayed from a URL, right? So we're using this image type network. So we're fetching this image. 
And so it's going to be easier for me, right? Remember, I'm always trying to make my life as easy as possible. I want to do the least amount of work, meaning that the least amount of data manipulation as possible, uh, regardless what, what type of app or which uh, functionality I'm building in my app. And so here, I just want to get the URL. So if a person picks a BMW, uh, they're going to select this URL here that's a link to a BMW. Uh, Mercedes, same thing. Mercedes right here. And the same thing for the uh, Ferrari. And same thing for the Lamborghini, right? And so what happens here is when the user selects something, this uh, car select pull down is going to have a certain value based on whatever they selected. And here I'm just specifying this value here. So if I click here, this is this value from here, from widget state. Very, very simple. Now, this flow is great, and this is really the ideal situation. But still, you're going to have various scenarios in your app where you can't really do it like this. And the reason you're going to have these issues is because you the widget the target widget that you're going to be dealing with in this case this image widget uh it won't be able to allow you to get a value dynamically so what do i mean well if you check out this flow here right this is a similar flow but in this case we are using images that are stored as part of the app so these these are local assets these are project assets right here and if you want to use project assets, well, guess what? You can specify that image type as asset, but you can't load them dynamically. And so regardless of what you pick here, you can't tell this image widget that's using image type asset to get it dynamic. I mean, there's all kinds of hacks to do it. There's all kinds of things that you can do, but out of the box, you can't do it, right? Because here you just need to select it right and when the app is running we want it to be dynamically done and so how do you do it well in a situation where the widget that you're dealing with cannot be set dynamically you need to do something else and chiefly you have two options that you can uh put to work that you have at your disposal to get things done and the first option is that you can create multiple of these images and each image is going to be a conditional so if i select this image here and I scroll all the way up, you see it's a conditional because this image here will only show up if the user picked BMW, if a certain condition is met. So what we are doing instead, instead of being able to have a condition and a specific field in the widget, in our image widget in this case, we are essentially making the whole widget a conditional. Okay, so it's a uh, you know it's some extra work it's probably not the ideal thing but that's really the only thing that we can do because we can't do it on, a, on this asset image level so as a result what you're going to need to do is create copies of your target widget in our case is going to be this image widget and you are going to have conditionals for each target that is only going to be you know visible it's only going to be enabled if a certain condition is met so i have four of these images and they're all conditional so this is uh merc this is lambo and this right here is ferrari right so if the user selects a particular um particular model particular make car make um we are going to display essentially enable the specific widget and so as a result if you run this app it's going to have the exact same behavior as the previous case now there is another option to implement the same behavior and that's by using something called a conditional builder so if you type conditional you're going to see this conditional builder and that's pretty much a similar flow except it's more kind of standardized and so if you click here you're going to have this widget and then if you click on your conditional builder you're going to have these conditions here so you have this first condition you have an else and so then you can say well if this condition is true and you add the child widget, that child widget is going to be displayed. If that condition is false, then this else, uh, you know, widgets under this else uh, condition here are going to be displayed. It gives you the exact same results, but it's a slightly different flow. Personally, I prefer this stack flow because it's kind of easier for me exactly what's happening, but you have an option to use either of these in situations where you cannot set that condition on a specific field inside the widget and as a result you need to alter 
which exact widget is being displayed instead. And so conditionals is something that you're going to be using all the time in your app because at the end of the day, that's really what makes an app an app right it's when the user is interacting with the app and depending on what the user wants the app to do the app is going to do something differently so if i enter some this value the app is going to respond this way if i do something else the app is going to respond another way and so this is very very important for you guys to master and thankfully it's very very easy to implement it with Flutterflow. Now, the next important concept that I want to talk about is the concept of state. Now, we already touched upon state a little bit in some of the previous points, but this concept could have been the very, very first thing that I talked about. It's that important. And judging by some of the feedback that I got in some of the emails, as well as on my Patreon and in my private community, a lot of people are not using state to its full potential and perhaps they're not really understanding how exactly state works now when you're building an app state is super important right your app has variables it has widgets it maybe has a back end but everything is tied together with state without state you would have no app now one way to think about state is it's essentially the bloodstream that's flowing through the app Okay, so like you have in a human organism, in a human body, you have veins, capillaries, arteries, where whose job is kind of to, to get the blood flowing to the right parts of the body. That's exactly what state is. State ties everything together. An app state with Flutterflow is extremely, extremely powerful because it allows you to do certain things that you really couldn't do before and allows you to build some incredible apps. So a lot of people think that the purpose of state is to essentially pass some variables to different parts of your app. So maybe, you know, display a variable that you set on the first page, on the fifth page, or display a variable that you set on the third page, on the second page. But that's just one use of state. Let me show you a very, very powerful use of state that gives you functionality that perhaps you didn't even know you had so here i have an app that showcases what in my opinion is one of the most powerful features when it comes to app state in flutterflow so first things first we have here a list of entities in this case this is a list of people a list of users so we have bob from atlanta georgia rob from san diego jennifer uh, New York, New York, James in LA, and Tristan in Santa Monica. And so apart from listing these users, I can also add another user. And here I can add Nick from San Jose, California, click save. And we've just added Nick and it's being displayed right here. Now, a lot of people think that you can only manage this kind of data in an external database or so something like Firebase, Firestore, or Superbase, or somewhere else, because this data here has a lot of interesting fields. And as you're gonna see in a second, there's a lot of intricate data structures stored here, but this is actually a local app state. And another beautiful thing about this is even if I reload this app here, this data will persist it's still going to be here so if i go to this tab right here as you can see nick is still here rob is still here bob is still here everybody is still here and i am not using an external database or an external api to service this data so let me show you exactly what's happening behind the scenes so if we go back to our ui builder here you can see that we are here on this page and this is your typical list view here and on this list view we are displaying the elements that we have so we have people here and people's app state and then we have this container here and it's taking uh taking in a name and a city and when you click save we are creating another person but how exactly is all of the store right there's a lot of things going on well that's the power of app state if you click on this app state here you're going to see that we have people here but people type is a data struct and so we are using one of flutterflow's most powerful features to essentially turn app state into our mini database okay so if i go to this data structure data types area here 
you can see that I have this person. Now, person contains three fields, name, age, location. Okay, so we have a name, which is a string, age is an integer, and location is another data type. So if we go to this location, now we can see that location is actually made up of a uh, city and state. And so when you combine all of this together, we don't need to put city and state here. We can just encapsulate that city and state as a location, which is another data structure. And as a result, everything is a lot, you know, more cohesive. Everything is a lot better organized. Okay. So we have here name, age, location. Then I can go back to location. Now, when I go to app state, guess what? I can just say I have people and it's a data struct and it's persisted, which means it's going to store it uh, with our app. It's not going to, um, you know, delete everything. It's not going to start over anytime we reload the app. It's going to persist. And it's a list of data person. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that, okay, we've created this data structure. Okay, it's persisting. It's app state is going to be available everywhere. But how hard is it to actually display this data? Well, it's actually very, very simple. Okay, so all we have here is your typical list view here. And in this list view, instead of using this backend query, we are doing generate dynamic children. Here we're putting in our initial value, which is this people. Remember, it's a list of anything. And in this case, it's a list of, um, you know, that, that people uh, data structure type that we've defined it can be a list of anything it expects a list of anything essentially and once we have it we're calling each individual uh, person as a person obviously and then we have this card here and inside this card we are displaying the value so if you click here we are we are displaying the person this is actually very easy right we have this person item and then all we need to do is find the name in the data structure field. So you can just select data, uh, data structure field and just pull up name. Now, it gets interesting anytime you want to pull in a value from another data structure field. So remember, we have people, but we also have location that's, that consists of city and state. And so this is exactly what's happening here. So I have this text combination. And what I'm doing here is I'm, you know, pulling in a person then i'm going to data structure i'm pulling in location but because location itself is a data structure i'm pulling in the city field and so i can do this as many times as i want so if i have you know very very complex um data records right you know maybe i have a person and um i have a name and name is a, is a data structure consisting of first name middle name and last name and then i have another data structure of uh maybe their school records you know their transcripts or anything like that that could be another data structure i can mix and match these data structures and put them all as kind of a, a, a person object right and then i can have an array of these uh persons essentially people as a as an app state variable and this means i can store just about anything and when i am you know manipulating this data whether i need to pull a specific a record or i need to save a record or i need to find you know something or i need to alter a specific record i can do all that very very easily so if you click on the save flow here i can open this up and all i'm doing here is updating app state and i'm saying well i'm working with people which is our app state variable, which is itself an array of, you know, people objects. And I'm doing add to list. And here I'm creating a person right inside of our action flow. Very, very powerful. I'm creating this new data type called person and I'm filling in the fields. And then for location, I'm creating another data type called location in line. It's all done in line. I don't need to do it separately. I'm doing it as i am creating this new you know person and then i'm creating this new uh data type called location i'm putting in the city i'm putting in the state i'm just defaulting into california and it's automatically created it's automatically added and as a result i'm creating this complex object that you know i can list i can display i can pass around and most importantly, I can save it with my app. So in this case, I don't even need to use Firebase Firestore. Now, granted, this is a relatively advanced uh, usage of this feature. This is probably one of the more advanced usage of App State. App State does not need to be so complicated. It could be a list of numbers. It could be a list of strings. It could be a list of anything. But regardless of how you're using, App State is fundamental because Anytime you have situations where you're dealing with data, 
and that data needs to be available throughout the app and you're not even sure whether you want to save that data in one of the previous videos which i'm going to be linking right there i was actually working on an app where the user is entering their workouts okay and someone inside of our uh, private flutterflow community asked me uh, how would I do the following? I have an app and the user is going to be entering some data, but we do not need to save that data until, you know, a certain condition is met. So they're entering this data, that data is available in the app, but don't save this data because they, you know, the user might discard this data at the end of the day. So we're not saving that data into our backend. And the solution for this is to use App State. App State is fully universal. You can use it in many, many situations from simple variables to replacing your backend. It's really, really up to you how far you want to take it. But regardless of how you're going to do it and regardless of what kind of app you're going to be building, it's very, very important for you guys to master how state works and how to leverage it in your apps. Now, if you guys listen to that last point about app state and you're immediately thinking to yourself, well, this is awesome because this is exactly what I wanted to do in one of my apps. Essentially, I'm building an app and I have a situation where I need to pass a lot of data around, but I don't necessarily need to save it to my Firestore or Superbase backend. Well, in this case, app state is the perfect solution for you but an even better solution is for you to be able to view and or clone this app that i've been showing you in today's video and you can do just that by joining our amazing amazing and rapidly growing patreon community because when you join our amazing patreon community not only will you be able to view and or clone this exact app that i showed to you guys in today's video you will also be able to view and or clone all the apps that I have on this channel. And I've built some amazing apps on this channel that do all kinds of things. So regardless of what kind of app that you're going to be building, regardless of what kind of features you're going to be implementing inside of your apps, chances are I've implemented that feature in one way or another. And so by being able to essentially view and or clone any of the apps that I built on the channel, you're going to be giving yourself a major head start on the competition because you'll be able to get your app to the market a lot faster as compared to someone who is merely starting to build the app from scratch. So regardless of what you're planning to do with no code, whether you're doing it for fun as a hobby or you're building an app for yourself, or maybe you want to build a business and build these apps for other people, companies or individuals, you're going to be doing yourself a major service by joining our amazing Patreon community. And beyond that, when you join our amazing Patreon community, guess what? You're going to be supporting this channel and supporting my work. And that is greatly, greatly appreciated. So if all of that sounds like something that you might be interested in, if all of that sounds like a great deal, a great investment into your no code future, then definitely check out our amazing, amazing Patreon community and consider becoming a member and you can do just that using the link in the description below the video now if you guys are looking for more no code tips i'm going to be linking a playlist of amazing videos you should check out that are definitely going to give you a leg up in your no code development